Hey everyone, Panu here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mints. I highly encourage everyone watching to join us in the Artblocks Discord. A link to our Discord can be found in the description of this video. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now I want to introduce our guest for this afternoon. We have generative artist, Marcelo Saria Cer Rodriguez. Hello everyone, and thanks for having me here. Thanks so much, Marcelo, for being here on After Dinner Mints. Super excited to you know, dive into your project and learn a little bit about you. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and start. Like, If you don't mind, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, sure. So um, I am an engineer by training. I studied uh, telecommunications engineering, which is more or less like electrical engineering in Spain. And then I, I specialized in signal processing, which is kind of, uh, well, you would call it maybe data science today but this was uh, too many years ago. And um, uh, the truth is that I, I studied that. I don't know exactly why, because I was, I, since I was a little kid, I had a very strong interest in more creative professions, let's say. So I was very much interested in becoming an architect or becoming a, um, an inventor, or uh, actually what I wanted to be was a car designer at some point. But uh, well, life brought me to engineering and uh, it was also something nice to do. And uh, well, my, my career was spent mostly uh, professionally doing uh, engineering, doing uh, software development, doing uh, innovation research and other things. Uh, but somehow I managed to convert uh, at some point into, into dedicating more time to, to my creative uh, interests, let's say. So I, I was doing a lot of photography. I was uh, actually doing also some music. Uh, my own compositions and so on. And, um, and well, at some point I decided to stop my corporate career. I was working at a large uh, Spanish bank and uh, where, where I co-founded a, a data unit more or less uh, some eight years ago, something like that, um, when data science was not so much uh, a, a hyped word as it might be today. Um, so we were researching the, let's say, advanced uses of data that we had. Uh, a bank has a lot of data about uh, what, what's going on, let's say, in, in, well, in a city, for example. So we were thinking, how could we transpose that into new services? Um, and then this kind of uh, sparked a lot of, uh, let's say, creative thinking, because it, it was not about, oh, how can we create a new uh, financial service, but rather, how can we create services for third parties? Uh, how this data can become a valuable tool for other people. And along that way, we did a lot of uh, data visualization, uh, which I was, uh, those were projects that I was managing, actually, I was not taking part in them, but, but somehow they kind of uh, brought me back to, to thinking, oh, you know, maybe with, my, uh, with, with what I studied, with, uh, with my university studies, I could be doing something else than just, uh, well, programming or, or uh, than just uh, managing teams or all the things that I was doing back in the bank. So I slowly went uh, again, let's say, into trying to create things with code, which I had been doing uh, for, for, for some years uh, here and there a little bit. Uh, and at some point when I, when I quit uh, the bank, I, well, I, 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 it, was, it was like a, uh, an attempt at uh, building my own company along with uh, another generative artist today, Iskra Velitskova. We were both working at, uh, at uh, the same company and uh, we were actually doing the same thing, data strategy back then. And we, we wanted to create a company where we would uh, use art and culture as a tool for corporate strategy. Uh, which might probably be just uh, an attempt at finding an excuse to, to find uh, some territory for our creative endeavors, uh, mostly. We wanted to invite artists, philosophers, and other people uh, to think about certain, I don't know, developments, problems, and things that were happening in society, especially with the advent of uh, advanced technology, which is the things that we were, uh, let's say, covering uh, when we were working at this financial institution. So we wanted to do that and we wanted to create new projects where, where uh, art would be used as a, as a tool to think, basically. Uh, but then uh, COVID came, so there was not very much space to do that. And at some point uh, we decided to, each of us, uh, start our own artistic career, let's say, uh, full time. So just dedicate ourselves fully to the things that were uh, 
a passion for us. Uh, and that's kind of where I started doing uh, mostly full-time um, art, dedicating full-time to either my photography or my writing or, or my uh, coding and so on. And uh, well, that's kind of what brought me here, but I think we were gonna cover that at some other point in this session. Yeah, that's great. Wow, I'm, I'm curious to know, so you mentioned, you know, music composition, photography, you know, that's something you've always kind of been doing. It seems like it was a great create, creative outlet. Is that something, you know, when you were doing both of those, was that something where you kind of realized that you wanted to pursue art full time, you know, down the road, it just wasn't the right time or, or how did that all come about? Well, the truth is that, um, like I said earlier, since uh, for, for a very long time, I always had this um, kind of uh, flame or intuition, or I don't know exactly what, that was constantly pushing me towards a, um, a more creative type of job. Like if I was doing this uh, strategy work at the financial firm, I was all the time thinking, how can I do this uh, different? Or how can I actually include different aesthetics into this thing? Or how can I be inspired by other, uh, I don't know, disciplines, uh, mostly music. So it's not that I, I was very conscious that I wanted to dedicate full time as an artist, but there was something in the back of my mind that was telling me that maybe I could uh, I could try to do that, you know, you know, because uh, probably all those uh, years of uh, of working as an engineer kind of uh, blocked the thought that I could dedicate myself full time to be an artist. So the the change for me was not really uh, seeing that oh, if I like doing music, then maybe I should be doing this uh, full time, but rather uh, uh, starting to walk that path. Uh, when, when I started, uh, like I said, in 2020, when I started dedicating myself full time to just explorations, I, I didn't even have the ambition of, uh, let's say, uh, building a career as an artist back then. Uh, I was basically just uh, allowing myself to explore full time. So when I started doing that is when I kind of uh, started, you know, uh, allowing this idea to form in my mind. Great. And then when you were exploring like, what were some of the artists that kind of insp inspired you early on when you were, you know, thinking about, you know, generative art and creative coding? So um, it probably goes back, actually, not not specifically to one artist or to a generative artist. My my early influences that kind of uh, uh, pushed me more towards this territory of creating with uh, with code uh, in general with technology, um, where. First of all, the the uh, painters that I that I enjoyed as a teenager, uh, which were mostly the impressionist painters. Um, I don't know, maybe they, their their use of color, their use of uh, uh, illusions, and all these things really uh, talked to me at a very deep level. Uh, then I always found also a very strong source of inspiration in music, uh, mostly typically um, uh, minimalist comp uh, composers like. Philip Glass, Michael Nyman, uh, which I which I listened to a lot when I was also a teenager, and um, and classical composers such as uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, which also has this kind of uh, well, it's almost like mathematics in music, like like the purest form uh, that you can uh, possibly find, and uh, in a sense, it's almost like generative art. It's uh, it's someone deciding some rules on a system, and then okay, he was not probably rolling a dice to decide which note to play first as uh, next. But, um, but he did compose um, immense creations uh, based on, on, let's say, a set of uh, given rules. So those, those were like uh, these very early influences. But then also uh, I was, I was uh, enjoying very much the demo scene in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, and all the computer graphics uh, that I could uh, that I could uh, get my eyes to see back then. I was uh, hooked up to looking at all the all the uh, summaries of uh, SIGGRAPH, this uh, computer graphics conference, which uh, back then was doing you know 3D and other things, and uh, and that always kind of uh, interested me a lot. So that that kind of planted maybe the seed, and then as I as I uh, dedicated more time to to learn more about art because I I, I still don't know almost anything uh, or or I don't know much for sure about art, um, but uh, let's say over the years I started dedicating a little bit more time to to learn. So when I when I came across the artists from the earliest uh, from the early twentieth century, 
from uh, well artists and designers and other people, uh, people from the Bauhaus movement, people from uh, the abstract expressionism from those years, uh, and 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 then most notably Sonia de Launay, which we will get to uh, later on in this uh, this session. And those started also like forming a very uh, a very uh, strong presence, let's say, as as inspirations. Also, what actually got me uh, first in these latest uh, years, let's say, in my in my um, going back to to creative coding, uh, what got me started again was a Spanish um, artist called Eusebio Sempere, uh, who did a lot of uh, geometrical explorations in the fifties and sixties, and um, and and there was there was an original painting from him at the offices of this uh, financial institution. They have a very uh, notable art collection. And the pieces of art themselves were there hanging in the meeting rooms, which was uh, absolutely fantastic. I mean, you would you would see sometimes uh, paintings by Francisco de Goya, a very famous Spanish painter, or, or or even they have some Picassos and so on. And they had this piece there, which which got me thinking: Can I can I really create something with lines? Which is what this uh, person was doing. Can I really create something with lines that uh, would be interesting? That was left there in the back burner. Uh, for a couple of years or three until I, I started doing uh, certain things. Awesome, that's great. And I I'm curious to know, you mentioned, you know, COVID was kind of a transition point in your life, maybe to kind of pursue art full time. And I'm curious to know, like, what was your introduction into the NFT crypto space? And, you know, did it instantly click or is it something that, you know, took you a while to kind of fully understand and something yeah. that you were like, okay, I want to pursue that? Um, well, I, I got introduced into the NFT space uh, basically by spending a lot of time on Twitter. Um, so it was probably late 2020. And uh, I had been already since the summer is when I started uh, dedicating, let's say, all my time to, to all these creative endeavors. And um, I was following a lot of artists that I liked on Twitter. And then this, this thing started to appear around there and and it was uh, I, I very distinctly remember one day uh, on a queue uh, to make a, a covid test a very long queue probably two hours or three hours queue uh, was going to be and uh, when i when i started reading a lot of things about nfts and i and i said um, uh, i was there with uh, iskra and i told her you know what let's go home let's research this thing this looks really interesting and uh, this might fit very well uh, some of the things that we are doing right now i mean this could be a, a channel for us. This could be something that we could um, well leverage. Uh, so instead of spending two or three hours in the queue, let's let's spend two or three hours researching this thing at home. So we, we just went back home and take the test some other day. Um, and that's how, how we kind of got started. I spent like two or three months uh, reading a lot about it, uh, becoming absolutely lost. Uh, I, mean, <laughs> I, I knew the blockchain and I knew uh, all the underlying concepts and so on, smart contracts, everything. Um, from, from my times when I was working at the innovation department in this uh, financial institution, but I, I hadn't come uh, across yet uh, with NFTs. So um, it was mostly about trying to learn about, oh my God, what, what, what are the, all these websites? Uh, how does this work? Uh, you, you create a work here, but then it's instantly available in all the other uh, websites. And it was uh, very interesting and um, and, a, and a very uh, strong, uh, a very steep learning curve for some time. Uh, and now, when I look back to it, it's, it all sounds so familiar that it's uh, it's even strange that only a year and a little bit more uh, has passed since then. Yeah, it, it, how long does it feel like it's been for you? I mean, I feel like this space, you know, time is just such a, such a weird thing for everyone. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. I don't know. It feels like years. I mean, I I wouldn't be able to to say, but. Uh, it feels like years, uh, both NFTs and also for me, it was like like a double change. It was, uh, oh, let, I, I was doing things without even uh, knowing exactly how to how to bring them to a wider audience. And then all of a sudden, um, these NFTs came along. But also uh, prior to that, I was working at a large financial institution for 12 years. So that was also like a big change. There were like these two large changes uh, happening very quickly. So, so this this kind of uh, really um, I don't know make you a little bit dizzy uh, and so on. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but it's, it's it's all fine now. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. We're glad to have you in this space. Um, you know, how did you learn about art blocks? Actually, I'm curious to know. Like you mentioned, you spent some time on Twitter. Yeah, um, just kind of learning about you know crypto and NFTs. But was there like an artist or a drop where 
you know, someone that you followed mentioned it and you kind of followed their steps or, or how did that art, come about? Art blocks. I, 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 I started seeing certain tweets about art blocks and probably I kind of pinpoint the very first uh, occasion when I came across it. But it was most probably through Ringers, uh, through Dimitri Cherniak's uh, uh, fa fabulous work. Um, I followed. I was following him on Instagram for for a long time, and um, well, I, I was very much fond of his style, and well, I was just uh, following along. And then on Twitter, I saw that he was uh, mentioning that he was gonna make a drop there. That it was a very interesting mechanic because it was like a smaller price than than uh, well one of ones typically. Uh, back then, and so the art would be available for a large uh, portion of, uh, well, of the audience, and uh, and well, I thought this this sounds interesting. So it happened that we had tickets to the theater at uh, 7 p.m. p.m. in Madrid time, which was uh, the exact time that the drop uh, opened on the same date. Uh, so I was uh, I, I loaded MetaMask on my mobile phone. I I had a, well enough Ethereum there to to try to get one. Uh, I failed miserably. I tried refreshing the page for to, for so long, and well, it was the, the button just didn't work. Maybe it was the, also the cell coverage within uh, inside the theater. I don't know. The the theater play had started. I was the only one with the phone switched on, you know, like trying to hide <laughs> it so that no one would see that I was with the phone because I was really much interested uh, in the works, uh, in learning how the experience worked and everything. So what I had to do was ne next time, ne sorry, next day, I went to to OpenSea, looked for it, and uh, well, I I purchased uh, one ringers for uh, zero point thirty six, I think, is what was uh, back, back back in the time, and it felt. It felt really amazing, the, the whole experience to me. Uh, and I also thought, oh, look at that. Uh, I mean, the mint price was uh, 0.1 and, and it's already 0.3 in the secondary market. And little did I know that, that you know, that these things happened uh, and that there, there are very weird market dynamics uh, going on and so on. But uh, yeah, it was, I don't know. To me, it was an eye opener, basically. It was an art blocks was the, the most interesting uh, crypto um, NFT uh, site that I a project and basically that I saw uh, during those three months. Great, and I'm glad you were able to grab one. That's cool that you're able to you know pick one up on on the secondary market. Do you still have it today then, or is that something? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, excellent. I think, I think I'll hold it forever as as long as the blockchain lives. Yeah, yeah, and well, yeah, and because that seems like such a special moment. You know, that's where you learn about art blocks and you collected your first piece and, you know, it obviously led you here. We're having this conversation. Um, I do want to talk about some of your work and if you can, were you, are you able to share some of your, you know, early generative art pieces that you've created sure. in the past? Sure. So let me pull up a couple of uh, images. This, these are the images. Um, well, this, I don't know if you can see my screen now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, all right. So this is, this is a very, very simple chart, uh, actually. Um, well, type of plot, whatever, that I built with uh, Python and Bokeh, the, the visualization library. Uh, and I actually did this uh, from, from Twitter data. Uh, and this was very much based on this um, Spanish artist that I mentioned earlier, Eusebio Sempere, who was using uh, just straight lines in, in most of, well, in lots of his works, just straight lines colored. And I was um, uh, very, very much moved by the aesthetics of his works. And uh, well, back then, since I, as I mentioned, I was working uh, in, in a data um, uh, unit. So I thought maybe uh, we could create some kind of a uh, fingerprint of, uh, of whichever data set, uh, user combination with the data set that we have. So I tried to create this, uh, these little images that were based on a, on a Twitter handle. I mean, you just input a Twitter handle and, and it would output based on uh, a number of metrics uh, a work like this. So this was my first real experience, let's say, uh, with um, generative art in, in these recent times. I had been doing some very simple things with uh, Flash, Macromedia Flash, a uh, long time ago. Um, but kind, uh, but with, uh, I mean, restarting all these things, uh, this was my, my, my first uh, uh, thing. And then I kind of stopped for uh, a year or two. I was doing only a little bit of this. And then I went back to coding. And actually, when I went back to coding, I went straight with um, with um, with the code that ended up being uh, Entre Tiempos. Great, awesome, and you know to show the 
progression of your art on the blockchain. We'll talk about Entro Tiempos in, in just a moment, but can you share with us, you know, your first NFT that you ever created and, and minted yeah. on, on the blockchain? Actually, it's this one here. Uh, it's, it's something that I minted on OpenSea. Um, so, well, it, this, as you can see, it's also, it, it's already entered into the post, like, let's say, mm. um, and, uh, well, it, it was, um, just an experiment, uh, for me, I, I, I wanted to learn about how to mint. I wanted to learn about, uh, well, all the, all the dynamics, let's say going on around this. And so I chose OpenSea because I thought that the, uh, the contract that they had, well, I would have to pay uh, less gas fees and so on. This was like the, the first one. Then I minted uh, another three in the same in the same. I created like this collection here, and I minted these three pieces, um, which which uh, stayed there like for a very long time. And then uh, and then when I got to know about uh, the Tesos blockchain and the Hikatnank uh, platform, I went over there to to well just to to keep trying and testing and learning uh, but let's say without paying all the all the gas and everything because uh, well I, I just thought it was interesting i learned about that uh, through a a tweet by uh, mario klingemann uh, and uh, where's this oh. where are you guys uh i still see you oh you, you still see me okay sorry yeah no you're fine <laughs> apologies so uh, yeah, like I said, oh here. Uh, so like I said, um, yeah, it was through Mario Klingemann that uh, I, I got to learn about um, about um, uh, Hickenlang. So I, I started minting some things there. Also, uh, starting from this thing, from uh, this polycircle uh, uh, technique that I was uh, developing, and from there I started minting uh, well a lot of uh, different styles and pieces and learning. And, and let's say my, actually my idea was uh, as soon as I can, I would like to, um, to test uh, what I do with, uh, with art blocks being for me like the, the, the topmost thing that I could ever possibly do, uh, uh, like trying to get into art blocks. But uh, well, I, I thought in order to do that, I need to develop maybe some, um, uh, some history as an artist or some uh, brand as an artist or, or I don't know, be someone because uh, you know I, I I had being no one at all. I mean I was totally new to to uh, being an artist. Let's say so. So that was my journey. Great. And and how was your experience just minting something on the blockchain? Was it did it take you a long time to kind of figure out which pieces you wanted to include, or is it just more of like I'm just testing it out. I'll just kind of take what I have here. And or like what was your thought process? You know, since these are like the first and first pieces you ever put on the blockchain. Yeah, well, so uh, it was, it was, um, I, I thought a lot about it, let's say, I mean, I didn't want to just, uh, oh, I'm into this image, whatever I have on my hard drive, and then let's see, uh, to learn, uh, I believe that uh, every step has to be uh, well done, let's say, so minting something that I was very much aware that was going to, uh, to be there for forever, let's say, I mean, unless I burnt it, of course, but, uh, but then there would be a trace of burning something, so <laughs> Uh, so I thought, well, it, it better be something that kind of represents you, that kind of represents what you are at the moment. I mean, of course, well, uh, that's that's uh, the code that I had back then, for example, or that's the work that I had back then. But to me, it had to be something meaningful. It had to be something that told a story about me also. So um, so that's how I, I decided to mint uh, those those first four images that I showed. Um, because they were part of, of, the pro of my process of both uh, making the art that I wanted to make um, and, and also of, uh, well, showing, let's say, uh, well, some, some of the things that I could do uh, still uh, with a long way to go, for sure. Uh, I mean, forever, there will be a long way to go, I guess. Um, but that, that was, uh, ever since then, everything that I minted uh, has been always been uh, something carefully selected uh, somehow, I mean, no, I'm not going to say that my selection is always successful, uh, but for sure, uh, it is something that I that I uh, dedicate a lot of time uh, to thinking what 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 should I uh, publish, mint, or something. Very cool. Um, so I do want to transition over to talking about your curated project on Artblocks called Entre Tiempos. It was released earlier this year in February 2022. Um, you know, and just kind of touch base again, like how was that experience to drop on art blocks because you know obviously you meant zero like the first mint you know as part of the project like how was how was that and then the actual like launching and release of 
the full project to you know all the collectors mm -hmm. well it was um a very interesting experience uh, again uh, learning about uh, how it actually works from the inside because well as, a, as an outsider you you just think oh well i have an algorithm i will somehow upload it and somehow it will execute um uh, runs and somehow it will be all uh, well connected to the hash and well let's say i kind of had an idea of how it worked uh, but then I had no idea of te technically what it would mean. And I actually had to, well, uh, refactor on my code. I was uh, working in a different uh, program. And I was working in processing uh, Python mode, which is the, 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 let's say, a language that I came from. Uh, I had to refactor everything to uh, P5.js. Uh, and then I had to do lots and lots and lots of rounds of testing because there were uh, several problems with the code, uh, several uh, issues that I didn't really know how to how to fix. Um, on the meantime, I mean, I was I was learning a lot, and and I didn't want to rush my my uh, dropping of the project. Um, I I got contacted by Artblocks, I think it was in September, probably 2021, and uh, well, because I had signed up in the in the artist sign up form in June or July, it was. And uh, it was it was very exciting to me to be uh, contacted by Artbox, and uh, I, I showed all the works that I had minted, uh, mostly on Hicket Nunk, and I, I said, you know, I think I could develop this algorithm, the one that I was using for my polycircle compositions, I think I could develop this into something a little bit more advanced, and that could be interesting uh, uh, for a long-form generative art project. And, uh, well, Artbox was very patient with me. Uh, I remember, uh, well, Jeff Davis was extremely um, kind and, and, and he said, yeah, maybe this is interesting, so take your time. And, and I took a lot of time, actually, because uh, I, I kind of started porting all my code uh, uh, in October and then I finally released it in February. I, on the meantime, I was thinking maybe I should change completely uh, the approach and I started uh, toying around with shaders. I thought maybe I could develop a shader that could do the same thing. Uh, because I wanted it to, to perform very, very fast. Um, but, well, shaders are still uh, ahead of me. I mean, I, I still cannot handle them very well, uh, although I learned a little bit to, to uh, insert a bit of uh, shaders of uh, post-processing in, in the images, in Entre Tempos. But uh, anyway, so I said, like I said, I, I did a lot of uh, testing, a lot of rounds, uh, and then uh, I had to go back and forth uh, in the testing and uh, in the staging servers uh, on Artblocks. And then, uh, I don't know, Mint Zero felt at the same time horrifying and magical um, because, uh, because somehow it was like, you know, this is it. I mean, I, I, I was so used to going back to the code, change some parameter, uh, tune this or that, uh, fix this uh, little bug or that little bug. And then it was from that moment onwards, it was like, let's say the, the moment of truth. So, so I minted uh, number zero, and then I just left it there. Uh, I still had to fix one more bug uh, in the in the live code before the the release. Um, and uh, well, once that was it, that was it completely. And then, well, the the, the release process was also um, quite um, uh, what's the word? Um, not stressful, but uh, well, I don't know. It was it was also <laughs> like, like, uh, thrilling completely. And uh, also having to do the, the Dutch auction manually was uh, was also, uh, well, uh, it had me on the edge because, you know, I had a timer there and I was like, I don't know how gas is going to be. I don't know if my transaction is going to come in at the right moment or not. I was a little bit worried with those things. But that all, all went through very fine when I saw that the mints were coming out nicely and that there were no horrible mistakes. I also uh, felt a little bit relieved. And, uh, and I must say that until today, I still have not reviewed all the mints from the project uh, because it, it, kind of, it kind of became uh, like very hard. Uh, I had spent so long uh, reviewing every single output. I have tens of thousands of iterations, I guess, like any other uh, generative artist who is preparing a long form art project. Um, but I had like tens of thousands of iterations in my hard drive. I had gone through so many things that I was, that until today, I was kind of scared of saying, if I go and I start looking at the mints at every single mint and I start discovering something that I don't like, uh, it might, you know, I, I don't know how I would uh, take that. But, um, but uh, well, preparing this session today actually has helped me uh, um, 
confront, let's say, this issue, and now I have no no issues anymore. So thanks for that, uh, for doing that for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm excited that you ended up, you know, going through a lot of these earlier, you know, pieces. And I, I'm curious to know about like the inspiration and concept behind this, because I know time scales is obviously, uh, you know, a huge inspiration based on the description that I read. And can you just tell us a little bit more about the that inspiration and concept behind this project? Yeah. So um, the the original inspiration for the project, uh, which was like I said earlier, the polycircle compositions that I was creating, uh, and also polycircle was the name that I came up with to try to describe these concentric rings that uh, that would intersect and create these uh, particular shapes that I, I well I, I very much liked. This all came from the works of uh, Sonia Delaunay uh, and and also uh, her husband Robert Delaunay, and uh, well they kind of created this movement called uh, Orphism, which was uh, derived from Cubism in the, earliest, um, in, in the early uh, 20th century. So I, I, I don't know exactly why, but I just wanted to create some system that could create outputs uh, that would kind of resemble the same aesthetics that the, as, as those paintings had, or, or at least some of the uh, components that those paintings had. Uh, and I was basically seeking uh, to create artworks that would move someone. Uh, in the same way that I am moved by the art that I like, um, uh, mostly with music, but uh, I'm not I'm not a very good musician at all, so I, I cannot do that with music. But I thought maybe I can try to to create some emotions uh, through code. Uh, maybe I can create artworks that will actually create emotions uh, in a human being uh, through code. And and to do that, I started you know just coding this uh, this polycircle system. So. Um, as along the way coding it, I started noticing that uh, well, some of the pieces would take very very long to render because they had uh, well a lot of uh, intersections and maybe they were made with uh, lines instead of solid fill, which also takes uh, longer to render. Uh, and, and and it was preparing the system to be released as a P5 project running on the browser uh, on our blocks. It was then that I decided to turn it into a dynamic project, interactive. Because until that moment, all the work that I had been doing um, with my with my previous code had been a, a, a matter of just waiting five minutes to see the image rendered. Uh, but it came like all of a sudden at the end of those five minutes. But then I was thinking, uh, well, it's going to be a pretty bad experience if you leave people waiting for five minutes. And also, um, it's it's um, it's going to be also a bad experience if I cannot allow the algorithm to express its uh, its uh, whole breadth of complexity. So, uh, which is which is one of the things that I uh, also like to explore when I do my generative artworks, which is well, try to explore the total space that a given system can create. So, um, so that's when I uh, started adding all the animation features. That's when I started animating the painting of the piece. And when I started doing that, is uh, that kind of helped me reflect on the time scales. So it was it was kind of a, a circular um, inspiration. The the creating of the piece inspired thinking about the, the time, and then thinking about the time also inspired some of the features of the piece. And this is this is actually what I was looking for uh, when 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 we had this uh, idea of maybe we could use art. Uh, as, as a tool to think uh, in a corporate setting. And uh, it's not that I'm going to use Entre Tiempos for any corporation, but for sure, it did help me think a lot while I was preparing it. It did help me reflect on a lot of things, uh, both from the corporate world, from our personal lives, from for, from every, every aspect um, uh, while I was coding it. And, and then the timescale thing, thing is... Um, um, well, I mentioned it in the article, but the, in the end, it's um, we are very much used to, for example, seeing an artwork finished. Uh, and we don't really know how long it took to produce. When we go to a museum and we see a painting, we see the final, let's say, very final version of the painting, which is basically when the artist decided to stop working on it for whichever reason, because they were tired, because they thought it was completed. Uh, some artists never complete a painting and they are constantly drawing and erasing it. Uh, and, and I thought that it would be very interesting uh, to, to look at an artwork from that point of view of a living entity which is never finished and it's always finished. Uh, so every frame of, of uh, an Entre Tiempos animation is actually the artwork. It's every frame, it's no frame, and it's all the frames at the same time. Also, 
um, uh, early on, there, there was a feature that I, I eliminated from the artwork that was that if you set it to paint faster or slower, it would actually paint something different. It, it does happen uh, in, this, uh, in the final version. If you, if you change the speed of rendering, um, what happens is that it renders at every step, it, it renders more or less um, intersections at the same time. So if you change the number of intersections that get rendered at the same time and they overlap, then you may see a diff kind of different uh, final uh, image. Um, and, and, and that kind of got me thinking, well, we are, again, if, if we do things slowly, we, we, we might get a different result than if we do things very fast. And that's now changing a time scale. That's changing the speed of what, that you use to do something. But what if you change the speed that you use to watch something? happening. Um, uh, this, this, uh, this idea of, uh, that I also mentioned in the article, this idea of um, the patient that uh, Dr. Oliver Sachs had, who had a, a mental um, illness, which uh, basically made uh, the patient, let's say, move very slow. His mind was moving very, very slow, thousands of time, times uh, more slowly, probably, than a normal person. Uh, Oliver Sachs thought that the person uh, was frozen in time with an arm extended, but he took a, a number of photographs uh, during, uh, he took a time lapse basically of the patient. And then when he, when he saw all the pictures uh, fast, um, he could uh, notice that the patient was actually blowing the nose. He was uh, extending the arm because he was going to do like this and then blow his nose and so on. So, uh, so that was also very interesting to me. And, and there, there have been other artists uh, exploring this, uh, mostly through photography uh, across time. But um, if, you, if you slow down time and, and you can look at a phenomenon from a very uh, uh, slowed down time perspective, you will see different things than what you see if you actually run the time faster. So this was all there in the, in the making of the piece. This was all there in, in the piece, letting the viewers change the render speed, and, uh, and also pausing the, uh, the render at some point, letting you save uh, every frame if you want. I mean, all those things that the piece that is doing have to do with this um, time scale thing. It's like, and also with the notion of what is, what is the artwork really? Is it, is it when the computer has, has finished rendering? Why is it not something, some step before? Because in the end, uh, what you see in that piece that, that you got is determined by a hash that initializes a random uh, number generator. But you know, maybe if it had been, if, if there had been something different in that random generator, then the piece could also be different. So I don't know. There's there are a lot of thoughts there uh, that uh, that I tried to explain in the article. Probably not enough, uh, but but that goes through my mind every time that I look at this artwork, and and well, every time that I also sometimes run the algorithm with different parameters and uh, different aspect ratios and, and other things in my computer. And I, I don't know, I, I spent some time looking at it and thinking, oh, here's a new thought. Yeah, no, I appreciate you sharing all of that. I really, what really stuck with me also was when you said, you know, that a piece is never finished, but it's like always, you know, finished. How did, how did you figure out like for this specific project, Enchai Tiempos, like what was the moment when you're like, you know what, this is, this is, this is where the project is complete. Like I'm, I'm done with it. Like I, I'm really happy with the result. Was there like a, an aha moment, or is it kind of just, you know, mentally you're just like, you know what? Like this is, uh, you're really happy with where you're at. Like how did that all come about? Hmm. Probably that moment has not arrived yet. <laughs> so, so you know, it, it's. I mean, I could have been forever uh, changing the project and uh, tuning this little thing, or adding this other feature, or something like that. And uh, I really liked the idea of adding certain interaction to the piece. I mean, I, 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 it, it is a little bit ironic because I never really liked very much, um, for example, uh, art websites that would let you play with absolutely everything in the in, in a piece, you know, long before NFTs or uh, other art installations where basically there is no artwork, there's only a tool. And then you use the tool, uh, it's a glorified tool with lots of uh, things and maybe you do just a couple of movements and there's uh, something nice comes off in a screen. Um, I was never very fond of those things. And in the end, I, I, I created a, a very large, uh, for me, artwork uh, that is interactive, that actually lets viewers, uh, you know, kind of shape the output, at least stop it at a given point or, or move forward. And um, the, the moment that I said, let's not keep going forever, 
was the moment that I was also like a little bit exhausted with the project. And the moment that I realized that, um, uh, and also maybe thanks to, to uh, the advice of Iskra, uh, um, the moment that I realized that I could go on forever. I could really go on forever because I could always think of uh, something else that I could do with that. So I would end up creating this, uh, this uh, monstrous artwork that, that would actually be too many things at the same time and none, and, uh, and probably would be also very difficult to tell. So as soon as I was kind of um, happy with the narrative uh, around the project, as soon as, as I could explain what it was, and it was kind of uh, complete, the explanation, uh, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I should stop here. Then there were some refinements that I could have uh, made. Uh, I could have, like I said, I could have reworked uh, basically everything. But, uh, but you know, I, I thought, I think this is expressing an idea already. And to me also, it is creating emotions. I mean, I, I saw some of the mints and I, and I saw them render live, which is the, the thing that I like the most, to see them come to life. And when I saw that, uh, I, I, I don't know, I started getting, uh, you know, something inside. It, it also spoke to me. And I, and I thought, well, if it speaks to me, then it's over. It's, uh, I mean, it's over. It, it's what I wanted to do. It speaks to me. Maybe it speaks to someone else. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to kind of like jump into a little bit more about the interactive parts of your project. You know, you have I know the looping mode, I think it was like changing the resolution, resetting the parameters. Like, how did you go about selecting those components as like interactive pieces for your project? Well, it was um, some of those were actually born out of my own needs while developing it. So I needed for sure, I needed to save stills. So of course you can save stills from the image. I needed to think, uh, how can I increase the resolution because the stills don't look so nice. And if someone wants to print them out or me, uh, then I need to have a way to increase the resolution. And, and I thought how, how to do it in a generic way, not to, not to limit, let's say the viewer. Uh, so, so I created this system where, where it's limitless. I mean, it's limited by the hardware, but there is no limit on the, on the uh, software, let's say. Uh, and then looping mode uh, also came out as, um, as, as, as a byproduct of thinking about what is really the artwork. Um, is it this frame? Is it this frame? Is it all these frames so far? Uh, or is it only this little slice here? So the, the looping mode is, is what speaks the most to these um, um, uh, time scales and time windows thing. Because it's when you actually see the, the work piece by piece. In the, let's say, normal rendering mode, you, you see it rendering and, and everything that is painted stays there painted. So you see, let's say, a picture uh, painting, whatever, uh, with all the painting poured so far. But you don't see what uh, the painter did yesterday and today. You see what the painter has been doing for the past month, let's say. So um, the looping mode was, uh, to me, a very interesting way to, to inspect the different pieces, uh, the different uh, inner parts of the piece, uh, what's going on here and what's going on here and what's going on here. And to me, it is as valid as, as an artwork um, as the whole painted image. And actually, sometimes there are certain frames in the looping mode uh, that, I, that I all of a sudden say, oh, I love that. Uh, I really like this as a still image, or I really like this loop as, as something to look at. Um, also, the looping mode came uh, as a way to maybe some collector would want to to have it on display. Uh, and, and I thought, well, if it's if they're going to have it on a digital display, um, maybe it's nice if, if they can see this thing going on forever, like the, the uh, piece always painting and erasing itself uh, as, as, as this metaphor of uh, both what is the work and how does uh, time affect all those things. So I don't know, there, there's, uh, there's different uh, places where, where I was picking up all the ideas of, of what to do with the piece. And, uh, and again, I had to stop at some point yeah. and, and say, well, enough. Absolutely. Well, with well, so like a project, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, you're talking about displays like digitally, you know, with a project that's so dynamic, like how do you prefer collectors display this project? Do you prefer that, you know, would you say that you know you would prefer like prints and digital like the screens, or would you want one over the other? Like, do you have a preference as an artist? I think it's up to the to the collector mostly, um, because like I said, my my 
one of my intentions with, um, with my art practice is to be able to create something that will uh, want someone to look at or to experience, uh, that will create some emotion in the, in the experiencer, let's say. So to that end, um, well, I, I basically think that the best way is that the experiencer chooses their own experience. Now, having said that, I do think that uh, Entre Tiempos, somehow it needs to be uh, experienced in moving form at some point. Um, I really enjoy, uh, just like I said before, I really enjoy seeing the pieces come to life, animating. Uh, some of them may take five minutes, 10 minutes to render. Uh, some of them render in two seconds. Uh, but then once they have been rendered, um, if you have them in live mode, then there is this noise that is always changing. And, and also the noise that is always changing, it's, it's also um, a reminder of time. Uh, it's, not, it's not a frozen thing. There's something still moving there, and and that's something that still moves. Uh, to me, it's it's an important part of the of this work. Um, well, that's 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 probably the answer. But still, I, I mean, I have printed some of, uh, of course, I have printed some outputs uh, myself, and uh, and I really enjoy them, and I, I really think that some of them look very very nice uh, printed in in various sizes. Uh, so I guess it's up to the to the collector. Very cool. And I'm curious to know, we haven't touched base on it yet. And maybe, you know, collectors or people that are would be are, you know, hopeful collectors of your project, uh, the Easter egg, you know, within each men. I'm curious to know, like, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the Easter egg. I don't know if you want to, you know, let people know, like what, like how to see this Easter egg or, but yeah, maybe just tell us a little bit about like, was this always a part of the project or kind of a late edition and, and the idea behind it? Hmm. So it, it, it came also uh, in, this, in this process of thinking about the artwork and thinking, well, sometimes an artist um, decides to, you know, like paint all over what they were doing and doing something else. It's like, I don't like this or, or whatever. And, and I thought maybe, I mean, I, it kind of came together that thought with, uh, with the thought, oh, um, well, if I change the hash programmatically and I repaint the whole system because I have I have probably too many functions in the code that do too many things, um, and 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 then it just came naturally when I when I looked at everything that I had there. I thought, oh, it, it would be so easy to actually create a new work, completely. Uh, I mean, it would be so easy to to just, of course, uh, recreate works, and this is inherent to any generative system. You just if with a different hash, you have a new work, for sure. But somehow, to me, it was it was an interesting thing uh, from that uh, also from that standpoint of um, what is the artwork? The artwork is this thing, but it could have been something else. So this is like a reminder that it could have been something else. It could have been something else if the painter had been uh, feeling different that day. If the sculpture had been feeling different if they had had uh, different ideas uh, along their process. And this shows both in the in the um, Easter egg and also in other. Uh, features of of, uh, of the pieces, like for example, many pieces have what I call uh, imprecisions in the in the piece, which is when I draw the the geometry that uh, makes up the, all the pieces. Uh, sometimes I will add noise to the to all the points, and this noise uh, actually varies by frame. So so that creates a more let's say oily like impression some, somehow or a more uh, man-made-like impression. But then if you remove all the noise, it's, uh, it's a perfect piece as painted by a computer. And I was, I was very much interested in this, in this concept of how does that make me feel? Do I prefer the piece that has imperfections or do I prefer the piece that is um, perfect machine-made? I mean, for example, all, all, the, all, the, all the work that I had been doing with my polycircle system was always, uh, let's say, perfect with no noise because the noise came up when I was adding all the animations. Uh, and actually, it has stayed like that for uh, other, other works that I've been doing since. I, I always add now some option of noise, uh, even if I don't release it with noise or not. But to me, it's, it's an essential part of the process. Because again, it is uh, another way of uh, adding some, some reality to something that is created digitally. And, and that is also some of the things that I uh, like to explore with the pieces. Um, uh, I'm not now answering your question, but but uh, this was a, a, an important part of the process for me, which is um, if a machine that creates a, a very digital, very synthetic piece 
uh, can create something that uh, will create a human emotion and how, how do we relate to that? Uh, so so that, was, that was also very important for me and that's why in the end I left the option of uh, viewing the piece in, in let's say, the uh, not imperfect mode or uh, I, I, don't, I think I called it full machine precision or something like that. So, and actually you can add those, you can combine the options. You can uh, open the Easter egg and then if the Easter egg has imprecisions, then you can see the Easter egg also with, uh, without the imprecisions. And then you can loop in the Easter egg and you can loop in the normal piece. And so all of a sudden there's like, like, like probably too many things that you can do with the piece. Um, and I totally get that most of the viewers um, are not really even interested in, 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 you know, having to play with the piece. I've been, like I said, many years developing software, and it's 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 very typical that most users never use more than one percent of of any piece of software. And the same thing happens with art when art is software. Uh, but still, I find it very interesting to to leave uh, space in the piece for for a for a deeper exploration by those who might be interested uh, in it. So, so the Easter egg is kind of part of that. It's, it's yet another exploration that triggers another exploration over the, the whole territory that the Easter egg can actually paint. And yeah, I can, I can, I can reveal the way to, to open the Easter egg. I mean, it was, it was hinted at uh, in the article, and I guess that most, most people already uh, found it. So it's, it's just, since, since you have to type comments uh, in the piece, I mean, you have to click on the piece to make sure that the focus is on the, on the piece itself. But once the uh, focus is there, you just have to type reveal, uh, R-E-V-E-A-L, um, and then all of a sudden the piece will actually change the hash. It actually changes the last two letters of the hash um, to some to two specific letters. It's always they always change to the same two letters, um, which creates a new hash, and therefore it, there is a new uh, initialization of the random number generator, and therefore there's a whole new piece that will always be the same for for each hash because it's, it's a stable change, let's say. And, uh, well, I don't know. I, I think people have kind of uh, enjoyed it, um, even though, um, well, maybe, maybe you cannot really see it very well, of course, when you, when you look at the pieces uh, on OpenSea or uh, any other place. Well, you have to actually type reveal to actually know what's going on. I'm a huge fan of it. I think it's, I think it's really cool. And I wasn't expecting it at first. I think it was after the drop you know, happened and I wasn't able to get a piece at first and then people were talking about this, uh, you know, the reveal, the Easter egg. And I was basically going through all the different mints and hitting reveal. And when I found the one I liked, then I, I put it in and I'm glad that I was able to pick something up. So I think it's really cool and I'm glad you're able to add that Easter egg. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know a little bit about, you know, the color palettes for this project. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you go about selecting it? Um, I do want to talk about, um, there is like a feature, it's a palette for Sonia, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that and, and why you included that in the project. Sure. So um, Sonia being like the major inspiration for all the aesthetics of the work uh, had to be there somehow. And actually there is this uh, painting called uh, um, Electrical Prisms, uh, the original title in French, if I try to pronounce it, it's going to be a complete disaster. Uh, I don't know, Prime Electrique, something like that. So it's it, it's a painting that it's uh, in the collection of the uh, George Pompidou in in Paris, and it's a painting that completely uh, I don't know uh, passes through me. I mean it's 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 uh, gets inside me and and completely shakes me from head to toes. I mean it's it's absolutely incredible the effect that that piece can have on me. Um, and and I I decided to take uh, to take the palette one yeah the palette from there I so was picking colors from from the painting I, I looked for the best image that I could um, um, actually at the Pompidou Center so I was just picking colors picking colors picking colors and uh, and and well then altering them a little bit to so that they would uh, work fine through several iterations and then I also took another work of hers um, one of her textile works. Um, that uh, that I really loved. So I also picked some colors from there. Actually, those colors are kind of um, um, uh, typical, let's say, for uh, for many artists in the early in the early twentieth century. It was uh, a palette with uh, some basic red, basic blue, and and white, and, and uh, some other little things there uh, thrown in. So so what I did was I added uh, these two or three palettes that I took from from her paintings. And, uh, and I created a feature uh, indicating if it had at least one of those, because the thing is, uh, each each Entretiempos artwork can pick up 
from, I think, up to six different palettes in the same image, which was a challenge um, to, to combine the, the different palettes. But, um, but in the end, I decided to leave it uh, to the algorithm. I mean, I was thinking maybe I could heavily curate by hand what's going to happen there. Uh, and and I, I mean, this had to be a choice that I made with everything, with the composition, with where would this uh, polycircle, these this concentric rings um, appear. Um, uh, there is a grid system, but then I also add noise to that to, to decide where they appear. So the same thing with, with color. There are a number of palettes, uh, a lot of them actually, which I, the, 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 the Launay palettes came from, from picking colors from uh, her paintings, but other palettes I just, um, developed um, by, 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 let's say, my, my own intuition, what feels good to me? What do I like? Uh, oh, I like this. Uh, I'm going to try with warm colors. I'm going to try with uh, uh, colder colors. I, I created like a golden palette also, which, uh, which I had been experimenting with to create like some special pieces uh, with the polycircle system uh, before the uh, Art Blocks project. Mm -hmm. And that palette also kind of stuck with me. So I decided to just put them in and let uh, the random magic work. Uh, actually, because that was to me the, the, the beauty of trying to create a, a long form project, to see all the places where it could go to at the expense of having certain combinations that might not work so well for some people. Um, I, I admit that some of the combinations that I see in some of the pieces, uh, the final pieces, uh, I, I look at them and I say, okay, I like it. But uh, I could have curated it, but then I always get back to the same place. No, if I had curated it, then probably I would have been limiting um, uh, the creation of something that I could not create myself. And this is the, the beauty of using actually coding for doing uh, to do generative art. I mean, I could I could uh, you know uh, pre curate everything too much, but then I wouldn't be going uh, places where I couldn't go myself. So so that is part of of the beauty uh, in there. Yeah, absolutely. And I would love to see, you know, some of your favorite mints from this project or maybe some mints that surprise you if you're able to share that with us. Sure. Okay. So let me, let me open. Um, all right. I'm going to open like 30 different tabs of Entre Tiempos works. And uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, now I have it here. I don't know if you can see it. Yep. Yeah, we can see it. Good. So, so, well, this is, um, this is, for example, one of, one of the things that I uh, found very interesting. The code is full of uh, happy mistakes. So the, this, these shapes that extend some arms, like, uh, I mean, they, they try to create an arc and then they extend some arms. And these are actually a coding mistake, a very happy accident that I had uh, early on, like, I don't know, uh, maybe February, March, 2021. Um, and, but I really liked it very much, the effect that it created. To me, it kind of, um, it kind of brought certain uh, imagery that I cannot really know where it comes from, but then I have seen it also similar things in works of, um, of um, uh, painters uh, in the 20th century, like Hilma af Klimt, uh, for example, some, some uh, nice uh, friends in Twitter pointed me to her. Uh, I hadn't noticed, uh, let's say, her work. Uh, but then I looked at it and I thought, oh, there are actually some things here that look at that, that look a little bit like that. Uh, so I also like this effect; like it looks like there's a comet coming in, and in this case, well, it's um, um, it's interesting to me. Also, at some point when I animated the pieces, all these uh, let's say these uh, trays, the trail that this arm leaves when it when it paints. I'm, I'm going to paint again, so you can see how it paints. You see, okay, as it appears, it leaves this trail. So this trail was also an effect of animating the piece, and I also kind of liked how it looked. So I just left it there, and that's why I, I, I looked at this piece. Uh, this one here is also one of the of my favorite uh, type of um, uh, well outputs, let's say, when you get to see the underlying rings uh, in black and white, and then uh, and then okay, in this case the whole piece is black and white, and actually this is one of those pieces that will take a long time to paint. Uh, but I really like uh, understanding the underlying structure of, uh, of the work. Uh, so I left it uh, as, as a possibility that it would show, um, let's say, that uh, underlying schema. This is, um, this is uh, one of the pieces that kind of uh, created this effect 
that I was looking after, um, a, a good combination between larger uh, rings, uh, larger uh, sized circles, let's say, and then some smaller circles, and then some artifacts here and there, some intersections, some of these uh, arms extending. This is kind of the things that I, that I loved uh, seeing in those artists from the 20th century and, um, and, uh, and that I tried to recreate. And to me, it was, it was a real discovery to see that my code was creating things that I had not uh, planned for, but still were in that same space of um, uh, visual language, let's say, uh, as some artists that I that I liked. Here, okay, now this is another piece that paints uh, a lot of things, but it also kind of recreates very well this, uh, this feeling. It also gives me a feeling of um, stained glass in, in some church, as if, as if uh, there were some, some uh, um, I don't know, religious representation of some of some deities that would be in the shape of rings. Then maybe this could this could work in a cathedral devoted to them uh, somehow. Um, this piece is not rendering. Okay, let me reload. Uh, oh yeah, this is again in the same style. And these these reds, when when whenever you see these reds and whites and blues, um, and those come from one of those. Uh, uh, inspirations that I got from uh, Sonia's paintings. Um, this I like, there, there are a number of pieces like this, very, very minimal, which I, which I really like a lot. This, this were also not, not happy accidents, but this is the type of things that I was expecting uh, to discover when I would feed uh, the algorithm with, with a wide um, parameter um, range, let's say. Um, this, these are the product of uh, a, a little number of rings, which create a little number of intersections. And they create these very minimalistic pieces where I like the flat black ground, uh, yeah, uh, flat background, sorry, um, with, with very little uh, intersections. Then there is also these this strange things uh, flying there. These are actually rings painted uh, with, some, with some bag that I, I, at some point, I discovered, but I decided also to leave it there as a very um, uh, as a very uh, scarce feature um, that, that, I don't know, I just, in this case, I just liked the way it looked. But again, it took me uh, back to, to, I don't know, to abstract painters uh, in the first half of the 10th, 20th century. And I kind of liked uh, the effect. This is um, an aesthetic that I, that I like also very much because this is an aesthetic that I was um, actually pursuing uh, when I was coding, when I was, let's say, uh, issuing uh, certain NFTs by hand, not through the long form project, but some of the means that I did during 2021 uh, with the system, with the precursor to the system, uh, I really liked these um, scattered intersections here and there, and, uh, and this combines it with the outlines uh, and so on. And I don't know, I, I really, I really enjoy it. Actually, this also, when you loop it, uh, it also creates very interesting things because um, it always starts painting first uh, the larger uh, rings and then the smaller rings. So in the end, it creates like this, this effect of, I don't know, like a heavy rain and then small droplets falling or something like that. I mean, that's kind of something that brings to my mind this type of pieces. And, and this one, for example, in loop uh, works pretty well. Uh, well, I don't know. There's, there's probably too many. This, this is one of the pieces that also will take forever to paint because it is created out of uh, thin lines uh, and uh, it has a lot of intersections. So whenever the, the field type is uh, thin lines, it, uh, it takes a long time. This one has a lot of noise. Um, I'm going to switch to live view. So maybe there is a little bit more detail. I don't know how well you can see it in the broadcast, but um, I find it very interesting in this type of pieces. I will stop the painting. Uh, I find it very interesting that this one has a lot of uh, uh, visual noise, let's say, uh, geometry noise. If I paint it in full um, precision, you actually don't get to see the lines very much because this one is made out of very fine lines. But if you sweet, if you turn the uh, resolution very high um, and you zoom in, you see very, very interesting effects in there. And, and I, I, I like um, some of the prints that I have made are from, from these line-based pieces um, um, where, I, where I try to make them as large as possible and then print uh, some, they, are, they look really nice. Um, well, let me see. This is also, um, again, this, in, this mode where you only get to see the, the outlines. 
is very interesting to me, um, just as an example of very flat uh, color and, and only that. And well, I like that very much. This one is, um, I don't know, it, it captivates my mind completely. Also, I like it when images start evoking you of something. And this is, this is a beauty of abstract uh, art. And then in generative art, it takes it to the next level because it can, it can like create a lot of, um, it can trigger a lot of thoughts uh, when, when you actually start exploring all the outputs of, uh, of the algorithm. And this is just very few intersections in black and white, uh, really nice. Um, this is not loading. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can check out, you know, two or three more. I think yeah. these are, these are so beautiful. I mean, I feel like we could go through all of them and from this one, I just want all the details. Yeah. This is going to be the last one. So I just okay. wanted to, to show the reveal. I mean, the, the, the straight piece, let's say it's also, uh, well, very nice to me at least, um, where it has this, this palette also coming from, from a Sonia Lone painting. But then the reveal, uh, it's, it's very interesting to me how this piece that has, well, you can play a lot with this, then the reveal is so simple. Um, yeah. But I really like this style again, uh, either white background or black background, uh, background and then uh, only in outline mode, uh, the intersections. It plays out very, very well for me. I, I really enjoy just looking at this and, and, and even just looking uh, at it um, um, like this, not not even in the in the loop mode or anything. Just looking at the piece because I enjoy the noise. I mean, I, I mm. doubt that you can see the noise in the in the streaming because it's it's probably uh, being squashed by the compression. But um, but I really but I really enjoy just zooming in and looking at all the all these little lines out there. And I don't know, it evokes very much also the sketch uh, qualities uh, of of uh, I don't know the process of painting. All those things. Uh, I don't know. I, I just like it. Yeah, and the details. <laughs> no, yeah. the details in this I think are just like stunning. You know, you can. I, I love how you kind of zoomed in there and kind of showed people. You know, like you said, they might not be able to see yeah. all the the noise, but I mean, just all the details, the faint lines, some of the thicker lines, and just really the composition. I think is is beautiful. I also like looking at that in in RY. I mean, in the looping mode. Uh, even well, this one this one finishes very quick. But when you see it in the looping mode, it, it even gives you more this feeling of the sketch. Like you see each yeah. step of the sketch, kind of. And uh, and somehow it is uh, also very evocative to me. And uh, I just, uh, you know, if you stop it there, you see something different. Anyway. I love it. No, I, I really appreciate you sharing those mints. I think it's such a fun project. And, you know, speaking of projects, I'm curious to know, like, do you have a art blocks playground project in the works or you know anything else on other platforms that you're you're planning to kind of you know create in the future yes so um my my playground project is something that uh, i am studying for actually <laughs> because i have sorry i have an idea of what i would like to make uh, for a long time now um i am very much inspired by light and shadow and and the interplay of light and shadow with pure volumes and and basically large architectural spaces where where there's light coming in through some window and then it creates a a some some ray of light and some uh, you know in, again like play with uh, light and shadow so i really there's something along those lines that i'd like to create and uh, to be able to create it, I'm, I'm trying to learn now much more about shaders and creating real-time um, uh, um, shadows and uh, light projections and, and other things. So, so that's something, it will take probably some time. Uh, but, but to me, uh, to release a project on, on art blocks, uh, either uh, playground or I mean, any, any part of art blocks, it has to be um, like, it, it's like my own highest level of curation. So, um, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put out a piece that is not very polished or, or at least that it's not um, um, a very good representation of, of what I would like to tell. Uh, so so that, that will take uh, its time. I'm also preparing uh, right now uh, another piece, uh, also long form art project for another platform. Um, uh, as a collaboration with another artist, but uh, well, that that that's also a very well thought uh, piece that I also like to to take a lot of care uh, uh, for. So it, it takes me it takes me a very long time actually to create a long form art project. Of course, uh, having now spent a year and a half of um, of uh, intense coding, let's say. Uh, I have a lot of uh, practice and I have a lot of um, 
uh, ready-made tools, let's say, that uh, help me uh, get faster to some results. Uh, but that also is sometimes a bit um, not so good because you end up reusing things that you had or reusing ideas that you had just because it's easy, just because you have it there in your code. And, and that kind of limits the, the new things that you do. So uh, that's why for this, uh, for example, for this, um, for the project that I would potentially create for uh, Artblocks Playground, I'm taking my time to, to really learn something completely new and having a very different approach to it than what I was using before, uh, just to make sure that, you know, I, I, I end up exploring some, some different territory and not um, falling in, in some, uh, you know, easy space. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, we definitely look forward to seeing that whenever it's ready on your end. Um, do you have any, I know you were, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you were in Italy uh, for um, just a couple of weeks ago, right? And I'm curious to know, like, do you have any exhibits or plans, you know, for the remainder of the year? Yes. Um, um, uh, well, uh, Italy was beautiful. Venice was beautiful. And that was uh, actually thanks to Artblocks. So thank you for, uh, for having, um, you know, uh, made all the work to, to have Art, Artblocks pieces exhibited at the Venice Biennale. Uh, for the remainder of the year, yes, I will be exhibiting um, some piece uh, actually at, um, well, at a large art fa fair, which uh, probably until tomorrow I cannot talk about uh, or something like that because it has to be uh, announced somehow. But anyway, I'll, I'll be exhibiting some piece there. And then I'm, I'm also starting to co-curate an exhibition, uh, which I cannot also talk about, uh, only that I, I'm doing it, I'm sorry. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to co-curate an exhibition around um, uh, generative art. So I will be preparing some work for that. Uh, and, and also, let's say, thinking about how to uh, exhibit generative art, probably in a different way, which is, which is also very, very interesting. It, and it, it has been a thought that has been in the back of my mind um, ever since I entered into, into uh, developing, let's say, my own art or creating my own art, which is um, which other forms can we think about uh, to experience it? Um, and, and, and this actually a lot of very interesting uh, ways to do it. And there's a lot of interesting ways that have been already done. So, so not saying that, uh, oh, I'm going to come up with, you know, this very new and fantastic thing, but um, it has been part of my practice, both artistic and, and uh, corporate professional. Uh, it has been always part of my practice to think, how can we do this differently? And uh, that's, that's what I'm doing now. Excellent. Well, yeah, we look forward to hearing, you know, the news when it's, whenever it's ready for, you know, those different exhibits. Um, and how can people reach you? You know, where can people learn about when these exhibits, when, you know, you're ready to make that announcement? How can people learn about, um, yeah, and I believe you have a website and maybe you can make some social media plugs for us. Yeah, yeah, but typically the, the, the best way is to, is to follow me on Twitter or, or to have a look at my Twitter account, which is, uh, well, msoriaro, it's a bit difficult maybe to, to pronounce. But it's um, it's it you know that was actually the first username I ever had on a computer system when I went in, in the university. That was my username, and that stuck with me forever. Um, so that's M S O R I A R O, uh, my my Twitter handle. And then uh, I have the same handle on Instagram, although I don't really publish much there uh, anymore. Sometimes I, I will update something there. And then I do have my my website, which I use. It was it was born mostly to write articles with my thoughts on on basically whatever or, or what inspired me, or uh, projects that I wanted to do or invite other people to write. And in the end, it happened that I don't find so much time to write, which is a bit of a pity. But I've been running some artists' interviews um, because I, I find it uh, uh, mesmerizing to know more about other artists and their lives and, and why do they create their art and so on. So I started doing this last year when I when I got into the NFT space. I, I started reaching out to artists that I liked, uh, and and they've always uh, been very kind, and they always replied. So there's a collection of articles also around that. There, that's uh, well, my website also. It's a little bit difficult to uh, to write maybe or to pronounce, but it's e elucid or I lucid or I don't know how to pronounce it, which is the process of becoming elucid and then coming to lucidity again. And I don't even know if those words actually exist in English, but uh, we'll probably get the point. Yeah, we'll um, include it in our show notes. No problem. Okay. We'll have links to there. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate you being on and, you know, Marcelo, just for sharing about Entra Tiempos and kind of learn about your background. I really appreciate all of that. Um, 
Yeah, thank you so much for being on After Dinner Mints with us today. Thank you all. Uh, on next week's pre-recorded After Dinner Mints show, which will be released on May the 26th, we have generative artist Sterling Crispin. Um, in addition to that, we have a Twitter Spaces discussion called Minters and Makers. This is a weekly show with anywhere from three to four artists, collectors, uh, or other notable community members with conversations surrounding art. Our next show is on May the 19th, starting at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, featuring D. Bachman, Dirtis, Big Bird, and Klaus. Uh, you can also tune into that conversation via the Artblocks Twitter handle, which is at Artblocks underscore IO. Uh, all those discussions are being recorded and available in a podcast format, which is available in all major platforms such as Apple, Spotify, and Google. Uh, speaking of all those different podcast platforms, after dinner minutes, including this episode here, all the audio will be extracted and turned into a podcast as well. Finally, we have a weekly newsletter that gets delivered once a week with information on upcoming drops and generative art related news. You can find a link to the newsletter in the description of this YouTube video. Uh, thank you again, Marcella, for joining me on After Dinner Mints. I really appreciate you being on. Make sure everyone you comment, like, and subscribe to the Art Blocks YouTube channel. Be kind to each other, buy what you love, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Marcelo. Thank you.